We've seen a little bit about quantum mechanics and how it relates to the branches of M. This diagram shows us the simplest case of a branch manifold with a single particle on it. Now we will elaborate on how to extend this description to the case of many branches and multiple particles. The branches of M will tend to stay close to each other because recombination increases the number of branches. The probability is proportional to the number of branches, therefore maximizing the entropy implies that the branches will stay close to each other and recombine often. In the diagram on the left, we see a branched 0 plus 1 manifold with two branches. In the middle diagram, the branches recombine, and there are four branches in total. There's a branch which goes from left to left, a branch from left to right, from right to left, and from right to right. In the diagram on the right, there are many recombinations and many branches. Increasing the number of branches increases the probability, which increases the entropy. There is therefore a tendency for the branches to stay close to each other, and we will call this branch cohesion. M is a branched manifold with many branches, and it is complicated. But instead of describing all the discrete branches and knots of M, we will model M with an unbranched manifold that we will call phi sub M. We define phi sub M as the unbranched manifold such that M is as close as possible to phi sub M. In the diagrams, we see a complicated branched manifold with many separating and recombining branches. In the middle diagram, we see an unbranched manifold phi m that we will use to model the branched manifold m. In the diagram on the right, we see a lower dimensional example where m is a branched 0 plus 1 manifold, and there are so many branches that it is depicted as a thick blue line, where that line consists of many separating and recombining branches. Then phi sub m is the unbranched manifold, which is the dark line at the center. Because the branches of M tend to stay close to each other, it makes sense to say that we can approximate those branches with an unbranched manifold. The knots on M take different paths on the different branches. We will begin by describing the knot geometry and the interactions on M, and then show how to model that knot geometry interactions using the unbranched manifold phi M where that model will take a form resembling the diagram on the lower right. Toroidal coordinates are a natural coordinate system to describe the knot geometry. The two-dimensional version of toroidal coordinates is bipolar coordinates. In the diagram on the left, the blue circles are sets of constant tau. Tau is a radial coordinate that has the opposite sense of the usual radial coordinate. Tau is a measure of how far away you are from the points at minus one zero and one zero. Tau goes to infinity as the size of the blue circles goes to zero, and tau goes to zero as the size of the blue circles goes to infinity. The red circles are sets of constant sigma, and close to the points minus one zero and one zero, sigma can be considered an angular coordinate. In the middle diagram, we see again the R2 pound P2 with a green circle such that every point on the green circle is attached to the point that is diametrically opposite to it. If we use an angular coordinate sigma to describe this circle, then we can say that every point at angle sigma is attached to the point at angle sigma plus pi. Now looking at the R3 pound S1 cross P2 in the diagram on the right, we've extended from bipolar coordinates to toroidal coordinates, which means that we include the polar angle phi. We previously described this diagram on the right and said that a point on the green circle in that diagram would be attached to the point that's diametrically opposite to it. We can now say that in that slice phi, a point at angle sigma is attached to the point at angle sigma plus pi. And this is true for every angle phi. We now make this description more precise using a mapping. The surgical procedure to make R3 pound S1 cross B2 is to remove a torus and then attach points to the points that are diametrically opposite to them. We therefore construct a map 
from R3 minus the torus into R5. And the end result will be a continuous three-dimensional manifold embedded in a five-dimensional space. We describe R3 using toroidal coordinates tau sigma and phi, and we subtract the torus from R3 by taking the set of tau sigma and phi such that tau is less than or equal to 1. We remember that the value of tau gets larger as we approach that central red circle, and therefore the set of points where tau is less than or equal to 1 are the points indicated in green and in blue for that particular slice at angle phi. We map into R5, and the first three coordinates of R5 are toroidal, tau, sigma, and phi. The last two coordinates of R5 are Cartesian, denoted x4 and x5. Then we make the map x of tau sigma phi. The first thing we do is take tau over 1 minus tau, remembering that the set of points that we're considering are those points where tau is less than or equal to 1. If tau is equal to 1, this is 1 over 0, which gives infinity. A value of tau equal to infinity means that we are located on that central red circle. This map takes all the points on the green circle where tau is equal to 1 and pulls them in towards the point on the central red circle. Sigma and phi are left unchanged, and if the mapping were entirely determined by these first three coordinates, we would have cut a torus out of R3 and then pulled the hole closed again. But in the last two coordinates, we do something different. We map to tau sine of 2 sigma tau cosine of 2 sigma. On the green circle, tau is 1. On that circle, we're mapping to sine of 2 sigma, cosine of 2 sigma. This maps into the codimension x4 and x5, and it attaches points on the green circle to the points that are diametrically opposite. Because this maps a point at sigma and a point at sigma plus pi to the same point. In this way, we have a geometric mapping that describes the surgery that we'd performed previously. And this map describes a first-generation fermion. There are other ways of embedding the topology R3 pound S1 cross P2, as shown by this map here. Where we're no longer mapping to sine 2 sigma and cosine 2 sigma, we're mapping to sine of 2 sigma plus n phi and cosine of 2 sigma plus n phi. The consequence of adding the n phi component can be described by considering the slices at successive angles phi. As we proceed through angles phi, we see that the mapping rotates. And for a full rotation in phi of 2 pi, the map has rotated n times. If n is 0, this is a first generation fermion. If n is 1, this is a second generation fermion, and so on. There is no topological limit to the value of n in this mapping that would explain why we see only three generations of fermions, but various dynamic properties may limit the number of observed generations, and that topic is described more fully in the paper. The geometry of the R3 pound S1 cross P2 rotates in the codimension with phase angle theta j and magnitude psi j. We can describe that geometry with a two-dimensional vector or with a single complex number, aj equal psi j e to the i theta j. We see that geometry described with the mapping where the magnitude by which it extends into the dimensions x4 and x5 is scaled by a quantity psi j and the map is rotated by an angle theta j. In the diagram in the lower right, we see an abstraction which we will use to keep track of the complex amplitude of a knot. When two branches recombine, the knots and the branches must also recombine. When the knots recombine, their geometry is recombined to the weighted average. In this diagram, if the two original knots have amplitudes aj and weights wj, then the resulting knot has a weight w sum equal to the sum of wj, and an amplitude, which is the weighted average amplitude, sum of wj inverse times the sum of wj times aj. In the middle diagram, we see blue circles indicating the amplitudes of the knots on the two branches.
When the branches recombine, the knot geometry is recombined to a single amplitude. That amplitude is the weighted average of the initial amplitudes, and therefore in the diagram, will be located on a line between those contributing amplitudes. In the diagram on the right, we see a green circle indicating the amplitude of the recombined knot. It's on the line between the amplitudes of the two contributing knots, but the amplitude is closer to the amplitude of the knot that has larger branch weight w. If many knots recombine, their complex amplitudes will converge to an equilibrium distribution. Again, we find that the weight w sum equal to the sum of wj and the weighted average amplitude equal to sum of wj inverse times sum of wj aj are preserved quantities at the recombination. In the diagram, we portray an initial distribution of knot amplitudes and assume that those knot amplitudes correspond to knots that are continually recombining with each other. After a period of recombination, the knot amplitudes portrayed on the left converge to a distribution shown on the right. The total weight W sum is preserved, and the weighted average amplitude indicated by the black circle is also preserved. The branch manifold may have many branches and many knots. In order to describe those knot geometries on the unbranched manifold phi m, we approximate the knots of m using psi equal to the sum of wj times aj, remembering that wj is the weight of the jth branch and aj is the amplitude of the knot on the jth branch. Then psi is preserved at recombination because psi is equal to w sum times a average, and the individual quantities w sum and a average are preserved at recombination. If multiple different distributions recombine, starting with a distribution like that shown on the left, they pass through an intermediate distribution where all branches are recombining with each other and converge to an equilibrium distribution as shown on the right. The quantum amplitude of the union of the distributions is the sum of the quantum amplitudes. Psi is the sum over psi sub m, where psi m is the quantum amplitude of the contributing distributions. The quantum phase of the knots advances at a rate omega, such that energy E is equal to h bar omega in the rest frame. In the paper, we show that energy is proportional to the rate omega, but establishing that the proportionality constant is equal to h bar remains to be shown. The path taken by knots on phi m can be a complicated distribution. We begin with a simple toy model where the knots follow only a small number of possible paths. In the diagram on the right, those paths are indicated by the gray lines. For each particular gray line, there may be many branches that have a knot on that path. But we will assume that the knots can only follow those paths. Furthermore, we will assume that they can only recombine at a small number of locations at discrete times, which are shown by the green rectangles. The probability of a particular event depends on the branches on which that event occurs. And for any particular knot path, there may be many branches that have a knot on that path. We look more closely at a particular recombination. Looking at this individual recombination shown in the diagram on the left, we see in the middle diagram an abstraction with blue lines representing branches that have knots coming into this recombination. A knot coming into this recombination can enter on any one of those incoming branches and leave on any one of those outgoing branches. The number of ways for an event to occur is proportional to the number of branches along which this knot can travel, which is equal to the number of branches coming into the recombination times the number going out. In the diagram on the right, we see a particular choice of an incoming branch and an outgoing branch along which a knot can travel. The total number of combinations is the product of the number of incoming branches times the number of outgoing branches. Counting individual branches is difficult, but the number of branches will be proportional to the total weight of those branches. And the total weight of those branches is equal to W sum, which is the sum over WJ. This is true for both the number of incoming and outgoing branches, 
and therefore the probability of this particular recombination event is proportional to w sum squared. The probability of a particular event is also proportional to the size of the state space in which that event occurs. In this case, that's the size of the state space of the branches coming into the event and the branches going out. In the diagrams we see on the left, two diagrams corresponding to a recombination where the knots have a small magnitude, psi 1. The knots coming into the recombination and the knots going out of the recombination both have this magnitude. In the diagrams on the right, we see a recombination where the knots have a larger magnitude, psi 2. The size of the state space in which these knots are recombining is proportional to the arc length spanned by their equilibrium distributions. In the diagrams on the bottom, the green bars indicate the size of that arc length and the state space of the incoming branches and outgoing branches are both proportional to that size. The magnitude is proportional to the average amplitude. In the diagrams on the top, the average amplitude is shown by the black circle and the arc length of the equilibrium distributions is proportional to that magnitude. Therefore, the size of the state space for both incoming and outgoing branches is proportional to that magnitude and the total size of the state space is proportional to the magnitude squared. Therefore, we find that the probability is proportional to the magnitude of the average amplitude squared. We've demonstrated two contributions to the probability, the average amplitude and the sum of the branch weights. The average amplitude is determined by the knot geometry as equal to the magnitude of the knot's extension into the dimensions x4 and x5. The sum of the branch weights is approximately proportional to the number of branches on which we find the knots. Therefore, the probability of finding a knot at a particular location is determined by how many knots there are at that location and how big they are. The total probability, therefore, is the product of the two, magnitude of w sum times a average, quantity squared. And we remember from our definition of psi equal to w sum times a average that we therefore have the probabilities proportional to the magnitude of psi squared. In this way, we have the geometric derivation of an assumption that is fundamental to quantum mechanics. We previously showed how the manifold can spontaneously produce pairs of knots, and this allows for the creation of virtual particles. In this theory, a real particle has one knot on every branch of M, and looking at the branched manifold Y, the particles in green and light blue are both real particles. The green particle never crosses any branching of Y and appears just once on Y and likewise appears once on both B1 and B2. The light blue particle crosses a branching of Y and where it crosses that branching it has a knot on B1 and another knot on B2. Looking at the branches B1 and B2 we see that the light blue particle appears just once on both of them. There's a particle-antiparticle -particle creation and annihilation shown in purple that appears on the branch manifold Y and also appears on the branch B2. However, this particle pair never appears on the branch B1. We therefore say that these particles are virtual. We model the branch manifold M, including all the particles, both virtual and real. Because some of the branches may include virtual particles that do not appear on other branches, we classify the branches using Feynman diagrams. For each knot type, we describe its distribution on M using a quantum amplitude on the unbranched manifold phi M. On M, the amplitude of a transition is the sum of the amplitudes over all of its branches. This is a discrete and finite sum. The branches of M are complicated, and therefore we approximate the discrete sum by taking a continuous limit, which is the integral over all possible paths on phi M. This continuous limit approximation may have unfortunate infinities, but we remember that it is only a model of a discrete and finite system and the finiteness of the branch manifold M assures that those infinities would not occur 
in a finite sum. 